I want you to see yourself seated in a reviewing stand in Pasadena, California on January the 1st to watch that beautiful rose parade come down the street. Bands, and floats, and horses, and clowns, all of the civic pride that's been poured into those floats, all the corporate pride and dollars that have been poured into those floats. I want you to just think about how you get stirred when the band plays one of your favorite numbers and realizing that whole thing is a part of the great welcoming in of the new year, a new opportunity to put your life together, to turn over some new leaves, to begin to take a look at what God has laid out before you as an opportunity to live life on a better level than you've been living it. You think about that parade or whatever great parade you've been to, perhaps you can think about today in a little different way. Most people call it Palm Sunday. It's interesting that in the book of Luke, which I'm using, Luke 19, for my particular preachment this morning, there's no mention of palms in there. Remember, this is written by a doctor. They're pretty exact fellas. They better be. We want them to be anyhow. And he doesn't mention the palms. That doesn't mean they weren't there. It just means that maybe to him they weren't really that important. I would like for you to think about this and call it Parade Sunday instead of Palm Sunday. There's something very spiritual about calling it Palm Sunday, isn't it? And you just see him come in with little palm fronds down. Remember when you were a kid and you stood by the wall with a palm frond and, and people walked out and everybody was very spiritual? If you call it Parade Sunday, it's like, oh man, what's that? Well, it was a parade. You see, Jesus took a tactic that was used by the ancient prophets and used it here in this situation to gain the attention of the people. When the prophets became weary of laying out words, you know, preaching sometimes is tiresome business because you work, you put a sermon together, you lay it on, they listen to you for 22 minutes, and they walk out and they say, nice sermon. Boy, it'd be interesting to put a monitor on you and find out how many of you really consistently through the week last week when you saw somebody, especially someone from the church, you said, remember the resurrection. Oh, yeah, I was going to do that. Did it Monday. I know you did it Monday because I picked up a guy from the church and, and when I picked him up at his place of business, he walked, that first thing he said, his secretary was right there, could hear him and everything. He said, remember the resurrection. Oh, I said, praise the Lord. One guy listened. And we went to a restaurant and I saw a fellow walk in from the church and he walked over and the first thing he said was, remember the resurrection. I said, Praise the Lord, that's two. <laughs> I felt so elated that people were doing, it's so easy to say, string together some words, preach. Do something for them. That's always been true. And in the weariness that sets in in preaching, there are times when you resort to other tactics. For instance, in 1 Kings chapter 11, this is one of the great stories. Great story. In 1 Kings chapter 11, here is... Solomon is still reigning, but Solomon has really let his relationship with God go to smash. And so God has said, I'm going to break up the kingdom. And he's given this word that he's going to break up the kingdom, but Solomon is still living. But there's some rebels operating, and Jeroboam was one of the rebel leaders. And you get to verse 26 of 1 Kings chapter 11. And Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, and the prophet Ahijah who had put on a new robe for this occasion, met Jeroboam and called him aside to talk to him. Come here, Jeroboam, I want to have a little word with you. And as the two of them were alone in the field, Ahijah tore his new robe into 12 parts. Can you imagine coming over and taking on my coat and tearing his baby up into 12 pieces and then handing 10 of them to Jeroboam and saying, God's going to divide the kingdom. God's going to split this baby up and you're going to be the ruler over the 10 northern tribes. Just hang on to those 10 pieces of my brand new coat as a reminder. Boy, you'd walk away. Hey, Solomon's still living. Solomon was really ticked off when he got the word on this thing. And Solomon decided he was going to kill Jeroboam, but he didn't get the job done. 
And when Solomon died, Jeroboam became the leader of those 10 northern tribes. And he had those 10 pieces of that brand new robe somewhere stuck away in his closet saying, God's given me the promise. This is a sermon I'll never forget. You look in the 27th chapter of Jeremiah. God had been trying to tell the people some things. And finally one day God said, Jeremiah, I want you to make a yoke just the kind that we put over the oxen, and I want you to put that baby on your shoulders and fasten it on, and I want you to go and give the message to the people. Can you imagine me walking in here and preaching a sermon with one of those things hanging on me? And that's what he did. He said, God is gonna let Babylon take you over and he's going to put you into a yoke. You're going to be his slaves in Babylon because of your disobedience. Very dramatic action that would grab the attention of the people. And we find Jesus in Luke chapter 19 and he is about to take dramatic action and he planned his own parade very carefully. After telling this story, he went on toward Jerusalem, walking along ahead of his disciples. And they came to these towns of Bethridge and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. He sent two disciples on ahead. With these instructions, go to the next village, and as they entered, they were to look for a donkey tied beside the road. It would be a colt, not yet broken for riding. He said, untie him and bring him here, and if anyone asks you what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs him. The Lord needs him. Sufficient explanation. See, it's so easy for us. Big deal. Just a little colt. A little donkey colt. And if we can just take ourselves back there and realize everybody didn't own one. See, we live in two and three and four car families depending on how many drivers there are living in the house. That's the way it is. Kid turns 16, first thing he's campaigning for is his own set of wheels. And we think that's the way things have always been forgetting our own childhood. Most of us did not get a car when we turned 16. We wanted one. Maybe we got a license, but we sure didn't get a car. And we think about that in relation to these rather than to understand that many, many people were so poor they did not own a donkey at all. Little groups of people would get together and they would buy what they called a corporate donkey. Now, we know some of those, don't we? Uh, they work for various places around. But they would buy this corporate donkey, they would own this donkey as a group. And they get kind of like belonging to a flying club. You know, you go out there, you can't own an airplane, but you can own a piece of that thing. And they, they would own this thing. And the disciples come and untie him. The guy says, where are you going? Four words. The Lord needs him. That's a password. The Lord needs him. Oh, okay. Not something they did not need. Not something they did not value. Not something that set them apart from others, but the willingness to give that up without saying, tell me what time you're going to come back. No, no. Okay. You've said the password. That's okay. Question. Am I willing to give up something precious and necessary in my life because Jesus asked me, money, position, home, family. Do we find ourselves willing to trust him enough that we are not going to ask 40 questions? We're just going to give it up to him and know that's a demonstration of trust. Just a little sidelight in him getting ready for the parade. When you see him in this situation with the colt, and they brought the colt to Jesus, 
and they threw some of their clothing across its back for Jesus to sit on. And now he's going down the road. He's not yet in the city, but he's on, on his way toward the city. And we're in a very, very interesting time as to what the tensions are in Jerusalem and in all of that religious social community. Turn to John chapter 11, Gospel of John chapter 11. Verse 45 says, and so at last, at last, many of the Jewish leaders who were with Mary and saw it happen, saw what happened? Saw Lazarus raised from the dead two miles out of Jerusalem. I just remind you that God does what he does at a time when it is most expedient. Time and place are important to him. This miracle of Lazarus happened just before we come into this thing we call Holy Week. It happened within two miles of Jerusalem. We didn't need for hearsay and runners and all of that. Here it happened. And the Jewish leaders, many of them who were there with Mary and saw this happen, finally believed on Jesus. But some went away to the Pharisees and reported it to them. You always have that division concerning Jesus. Are you a believer? Are you a disciple? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Or are you set against him? Do you find yourself set against him? And the two camps immediately were identified. But notice what happened in verses 55 through 57. The Passover, a Jewish holy day, was near, and many country people arrived in Jerusalem several days early so that they could go through the cleansing ceremony before the Passover began. They estimate the population of Jerusalem at this time at about 30,000. But they estimate that during this feast time, as many as 150,000 people were crowded into that area. See, when you take a look at five times as many people being around and all of the excitement that goes on with the festival, and they wanted to see Jesus. And as they gossiped in the temple, you ever find yourself gossiping in the temple? I try to encourage you to gossip in the right direction. Gossip about who you're going to send an invitation to Easter to. That's right kind of gossip. As they gossiped in the temple, they asked each other, what do you think? Will he come for the Passover? What do you think? Jesus going to show up? And meanwhile, the chief priests and the Pharisees had publicly announced that anyone seeing Jesus must report him immediately so they could arrest him. Here he came on a donkey, the symbol of peace. He didn't come riding this white charger, this great horse, the symbol of war. He came on a donkey, the symbol of peace, the reminding that he will put the spotlight on himself. I get excited when I think about the parade that he planned it. It's time now to stop just doing things. It's time to stop telling people, don't tell anybody I healed you. Don't tell anybody I healed you. Go get me a donkey. I'm going to ride into town. I'm going to ride in in this parade. I'm going to be the spotlight figure in this parade. And even though he was the spotlight figure, when you see him here in Luke chapter 19, verse 38, they are saying, and the people are doing these wonderful things, God has given us a king. Long live the king. Let all heaven rejoice. Glory to God in the highest heavens. The last time we heard that was when the announcement of the birth of Christ came. Glory to God in the highest heavens. We came today to pray. We sang this Easter sing-along, a part of our praise. We listen to the choir sing victory in Jesus, and we think about what we know happened and that we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and that's what gives us great hope because it's hope for now and it's hope for all of eternity because of a risen Christ. 
We listened as Penny played, To God be the glory. Great things he has done. And you put all of that together, and you rejoice in all of that. They weren't quite as pure. This crowd by the roadside was not quite as pure. This crowd, they were looking to Jesus to set them free from Rome and to establish a national kingdom. I'm afraid there's a bit of that going on in America today. I think it's good for us to be reminded that God sent Jesus to come and call out a people who would follow him and worship him. God did not send Jesus to save America. It is so easy for us to get in the place to where everything we do in the gospel relates to the saving of America. And we want America saved because none of us wants to live under persecution. I don't want to live under persecution either. None of us wants to live in the difficulty where you gather for worship and someone may knock the door down and stand with those automatic weapons and say, clear out. We can't even imagine that. It's so easy for us to live with that notion of nationalism, and that's exactly what they had, and we're trying to turn that picture just a little more to the individual that needs to come to Christ, and that's why we had Penny play, To God Be the Glory. Great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave his son. And through him, we have eternal life. We have salvation. We have a way to go. Under the pressures and problems and difficulties of life, we have a way to go because of a commitment to Jesus Christ, the Savior. And Jesus, as the king, is in gentle confrontation with the Pharisees, those who were among this crowd, walking and watching. They said to Jesus, Sir, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus very gently said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road will burst into cheers. What a statement. What a quiet put down. The stones understand more than people. They understand who their creator is. And they would cheer and acknowledge him if the people didn't take up the chance. I want you to notice in the midst of this parade and a part of the purpose of this parade was one last appeal to the Jewish people. As they came closer to Jerusalem, they're not in the city yet, he saw the city ahead and he began to cry. As you come over the Mount of Olives, down toward Jerusalem, there is one corner that you turn and there lays the city in front of you in perfect panoramic view. He came to that place. You can still stand at that place. And you can see what he saw. And he looked at that city and he began to weep. And he said these words, Eternal peace was within your reach. And you turned it down. And now it is too late. And he wept openly in the midst of his own great parade. And then he made this prediction. Your enemies will pile up earth against your walls and encircle you and close in on you and crush you to the ground and your children within you. Your enemies will not leave one stone upon another for you have rejected the opportunity God offered you. Those words came true. They piled up dirt. Within 40 years of this date, they piled up dirt against the outside walls of Jerusalem and literally ran over those walls and took this city and crushed it and left not one stone upon another. Destroyed the city just as Jesus had predicted. I think about Parade Sunday. I think about the excitement and the joy It should always be there in a parade. But then I think about the sadness. I think about a few clothes scattered on the road. Jesus is riding on a borrowed donkey, and he won't even live out the week, and he'll be gone. See, see that whole picture 
put yourself in that situation. Understand that in our lives so often a parade, a special event is a prelude to being discarded. How is it you work 42 years for a company and you're about to retire? They haven't had a dinner for you. You've worked faithfully and hard 42 years and finally they say, let's have a dinner for old Bolivar. We're going to give old Bolivar a gold watch and we're going to engrave this gold watch with this date. Thank you, Bolivar. You've been wonderful. And we're going to hand this to old Bolivar and we're going to discard him. Often wondered if companies had enough sense to put together something where they made as much fuss over people when they're 10 years into their employment with a company and bless them and have a big dinner and present them a gold watch and say, keep on. We don't do that much. Retirement dinners are more in line with the way that we think. Move on. Move over. Get out of the way, old man. The company is moving ahead. And we don't need old timers like you around. You have served us as well as you're ever going to service, and it's over. I think about who was in the crowd. I think about Bartimaeus, the blind guy that sat by the road and yelled out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, bring him here, and he healed him. I think about Lazarus. <laughs> Did he have a story to tell? Is he at the parade? You bet your life he's at the parade. And all the people are nuts and one another and say, that's Lazarus over there. Yeah, the good looking guy with a neat tan. Yeah, the one that just was pulled out of the grave the other day was dead four days. And Nicodemus, rich and powerful and secret, in his belief, he had to be there. Admiring and loving Jesus and knowing he was the Messiah. And many others there to whom Jesus gave one more chance to respond to him as their king. To embrace his truth, to believe and to trust him. I wonder about you. This morning, it's one more chance. The gospel is there. The opportunity is open. The responsibilities are clearly outlined. And my question to you, saint or sinner, what will you do with Jesus, who's called the Christ? What will you do with this one who put together this great parade? What will you do with the imagery that he predicted as he moved through that crowd and presented to these people, what will you do? Our Father, so simply did Jesus give to us a picture that we cannot forget on Parade Sunday. That we either stand as one of those who cheers and believes in him that he is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Or we stand there saying, what can he do? He's on a borrowed donkey. He won't live out the week. Oh, my Father, I pray that we would open ourselves to receive the message. I pray for believers in this place that look at Fresno and never shed a tear. Never weep over the lost. I pray that this picture of Jesus looking at Jerusalem with broken heart and with the tears running down his face and openly weeping for them because of their rejection. Oh, my Father, how I pray that we would find ourselves alone in our place of prayer, weeping over individuals in this city that need to know Jesus Christ then we'll not have to be begged to invite folks in. We'll not have to be begged to do what must be done 
to fill that place of worship next Sunday. Not for our sakes, not for our glory, but to the glory of God we pray. Move upon us with great power. We'll give you thanks in the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.